All right, you know it's gonna be a good day when you have your entire drive line disassembled and blasted apart in the middle of the street. So let me talk to you guys about what occurred taking my SM465 off my 5.3 LS engine. Obviously you can see I kind of did some damage taking it apart and that is because the input shaft of the SM465 was fused not only to the pilot bearing, it was also fused to the clutch. So that was my issue with that transmission all along. You know, the, at the end of the day, I press fit that together. It wasn't quite loosey goosey going together and I did have to thread some bolts through it to get it together. And you know, that's usually not the right answer since if you have to press it together, something's probably not aligned right. So I take full accountability for messing that up and I also take full accountability for how I had to get it apart. As you can see, I took a nice big five pound mallet to that bell housing to break it apart and then I had to cut the input shaft of the SM465 with about 13, thick metal torch Milwaukee sawzall blades, but you know, it came out. So end of the day, it's all good. So yeah, it was definitely a lot of carnage, but you know, at the end of the day, it's out, everything's ready. And we're about to swap in a turbo 350, eventually a turbo 400, but a turbo 350 was all I can find locally to me without having to drive 10 hours to go find a nice turbo 400. So yeah, like I said, the transmission I'm gonna put behind this LS53 LM7 2001 block is gonna be a turbo 350. Ideally, I wanted a turbo 400, but there was none locally to me, so a turbo 350 will have to do. I picked this one up used from a guy swapping to a 4L80. So it came out of a Corvette, so I think that is about it on catching you guys up with the 1939 Rat Rod. So let's get started talking about what we're going to do to get this 350 made it to this LS. Okay, so as you can see, I have my flex plate and spacer already on and torqued on the back of the LS. The kit I used for this was the JEGS LS Gen 3 kit. And as you can see, I have the short crankshaft LS. You can see back there, there's not any gap between the flange and the rest of the flex plate. With that being said, the short crankshaft LS requires a spacer. That way the torque converter can ride directly against the flex plate. And this kit also has bolt holes that are spaced out for LS, so you don't have to elongate them yourself. Just to show you what I'm talking about, as you can see, the torque converter, this is just a stock torque converter for now. I'll probably go to a higher stall eventually, but for now, stock's gonna have to do. As you can see, it rides in the spacer perfectly and allows it to sit flush against the flex plate. And that's what you want. You want it to be able to sit in that spacer. If that spacer wasn't there, the torque converter wouldn't be able to press against anything. That's why you require that spacer. All it does is allow the torque converter to sit on that outside lip right there. That way you're nice and flush with the flex plate. All right, so that catches you guys up on the Turbo 350 mating to the LS. There's really not much more to say, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this torque converter filled and seat it in the Turbo 350, and then the Turbo 350 made it to the back of the 5.3. So I got my three clicks in the torque converter. Everything's installed fully. And yes, I'm using my old flywheel from my SM465 debacle as a transmission plate jack holder thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this installed. Alright guys, I don't know if you can see the ear of the torque converter in the back of the flex plate right there, but that's way more than an eighth of an inch gap. I know on small block Chevys you want about an eighth of an inch gap, that way you have those ears fully seated in the pump for the transfer or for the transmission. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and have to shim those. That's the reason why. Nothing else really to it. I'm just going from this side of the engine. You can see I got a nice clean access right there. I'll be able to put a torque wrench in there nice and easily. This torque converter, because it is older, has the nut and bolts. There's no welding on nuts. So it makes it a little harder to get the shim nut and bolt in there, but no problem. I'll get it done. 
All right, guys, that's how it looks shimmed. There is a little less than an eighth of inch gap in there. You can't really tell on camera, but once I pull that together, that'll all be tight. But those are the hardened, I'm using hardened washers because I want this to uh, not blow itself up right away, but that's how it works. Nut on the torque converter, bolt going through the back of the flex plate, and then we got two shims to keep that spacing right uh, between the torque converter and the flex plate. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that for three more, and then we'll call this one done. All right, so we got about 20 things. Not that you can read that, but we got about 20 things to do. I'll read them off. We got to get rid of the old motor mount that's still stuck on the steering shaft. We're going to make new ones that are going to go around the steering shaft, so we won't need that. We got to do some brake pedal support because the brake pedal moves the whole master cylinder setup. We got to bash a header and we got to remove the exhaust studs that are stuck in the engine. So uh, as you can see, there's one stud in there as well as one stud on the very end that are stuck in the engine. And so we're gonna need to get those out before we do anything else. So I'm gonna go ahead and drag the welder out and get started on removing all this old junk and clearing the way for this new drivetrain setup. All right, as you can see, there's my support for my brake pedal going right to the outside of my steering shaft. I'm happy with that. You know, at the end of the day, maybe it could be better, but uh, it's a rat rod. It's in there, it's not going anywhere. Brake pedal's nice and sturdy. That's done. As for the rest of everything else, the rest of the engine engine bay is cleaned up to where I want it with where everything's gonna go. Everything else I can work around. So for now, we're going to go ahead and get the angle of this drive line right, try and drop it in, get it set in place with the engine hoist, and then we'll start working on mounts for the engine as well as transmission. Yep, it is uh, raining outside, so uh, gonna take some time off. We got a little bit left. All we gotta finish up now is getting the motor mounts and the trans mounts in, and then we can just start plugging everything back together. So, uh... all right, so uh, I made a cross member for the Turbo 300. And uh, it's on fire because this was from the 79 CJ5 that it came out of. So once I welded it on, all the grease that I refused to clean off decided to catch on fire. So here we go. Nice flaming cross member is going to go in to hold the transmission up in a little bit. We're going to let that burn itself off. And uh, all that's really doing is just preheating the metal. That way that weld stays hot and it cools nice and slowly. So, you know, really, I'm just really ahead of the game, scientifically speaking, with those welds. It's definitely not because I'm too lazy to clean off grease before I weld. But, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to let that uh, cool very slowly. And, uh, yeah. All right, bada bing, bada boom. There's the motor mounts. Two pieces of quarter inch steel. Top one is flat bar. Bottom one is a two by two angle piece. And that's how the motor mounts are on both sides. You know what? I told myself, you know what? I'm gonna make these temporary. That way, you know, end of the day, I can put new nice ones in when I change it. Uh, we'll see how we'll see how that plan comes to fruition if I even change these or not. So, those are in. They're uh, not the prettiest, but they're definitely functional, and that's gonna hold the motor in place for now. Like David Freiberger says, it's better to have a car that runs than a car that doesn't. It's a lot more fun. So we're gonna go ahead and charge along and uh, finish up getting this transmission mounted with that new flaming cross member and then i'll check back in when everything's in place and we can talk about what's left nope you're not seeing that incorrectly i did a bunch more work off camera because i don't know if i've said this yet but i am moving which means i don't really have a lot of time to finish this so when i do things off camera i'm just trying to get the work done and it's not really going to be super interesting to watch it's really just busy work so i did a bunch of busy work i got all the busy work done and let me catch you guys back up on the 39 and what we have left to make it run and drive and have a good time with it as you can see i picked up a custom drive shaft from a local drive shaft shop and i paid about 300 dollars for this drive shaft completely custom it's three inch 120 wall tubing with 1310 u-joints and it came with the yoke for the 350 so i've gone to them a lot and they really hooked me up on this one if you're ever in columbus georgia foreman powertrain is the spot to go for any drive shaft work all right now getting under the car you can see i have the shifter all wired in as well that linkage is a cable linkage goes straight to the turbo 350 nothing too special about that that is a b and m shifter 
it came as a complete kit, super easy to install, took about 10 minutes. As well, I reused my stock CJ5 cross member. This frame is from a 79 CJ5, and I had a cross member laying around, so that's what I used. I welded that directly to the frame rails, and then I welded it to the mounting bracket on the bottom of the Turbo 350, and that's how that works. So now if I ever need to pull it out, I have to pull the engine forward, but there's plenty of room to do that with where I position the engine, so no worries. That's in permanently. Everything's hooked up. Everything's nice and tightened up on the Turbo 350. I also have my vacuum going to the manifold. The only two things that aren't hooked up on this Turbo 350 are the cooler ports because I'm waiting on some fittings to run to the trans cooler and the detent cable I'm not going to hook up to the carburetor. I think this car is going to be light enough. I don't think I need to kick down. So, you know, that's how that works. That's how this is all in place. And uh, I'd be hard pressed for you guys to find a better mounting method than these uh, 600 pound zip ties for my radiator. But yeah, that's how the radiator is connected. Six heavy duty zip ties and uh, I don't think I'm going to change it. You know, it's temporary right now, but uh, I don't think I'm going to change it. It's probably going to stay there, especially once I get that tombstone um, over the front of the radiator for protection. I think those zip ties are perfectly adequate to hold it in place and uh, you won't be able to see them too well with the tombstone that's going to go in front of it. The next thing we're going to do is build that tombstone for the front and once that's tombstone and when I say tombstone all I'm really talking about is like a nice big protector for that grill right there. It's going to be shaped somewhat like you know a model A front grill or anything from that era with those big fat uh, oval shaped front grills so that's the shape I'm going to go with and to build it I'm going to use some scrap one by one and some scrap expanded steel. This is all I have in the shop right now. Like I said, I'm moving, so I don't really have a lot of steel in stock. So we're gonna try and make this work. And then if I don't like it, we can always move to something different and build a better one in the future. But so yeah, there's a profile shot of it. So you can see the rake of the engine and rake of the body with the rest of the car. I think it looks a little cartoony, but nothing too crazy. It's kind of just a little bit like street freaky and a little bit like Mad Maxi, but I like it. I like the way everything's hanging. I like that the exhaust now hangs down a little bit lower. It gives more emphasis to the body angle. All right, I moved inside to get away from the heat for a little bit. Here's a rough idea of what I'm going for. Nice, easy little tombstone design. Gonna put that expanded seal on the back side of that one by one frame. And then we're gonna call the grill guard done. And we get to see how it looks on the 39. I actually have no idea how it's gonna look. I don't know if it's gonna look good or bad, or if I'm gonna like it or not like it. So uh, pretty excited to get this one done and then get it welded onto the 39. And we can get to uh, examining our piece of yard artwork that we're gonna shove on the front of the 39. That is it for this time guys. I know this one was a little bit of a long video, but the 1939 is running and driving plus or minus a few small things I get to do to it myself. Also, I'm planning on taking the Red Dodge to Morris Mountain again uh, this week or next, so there should be a video coming up actually flex testing and rock testing the second gen rock crawler. So hopefully I get that one knocked out of the way before I move. So yeah, other than that guys, that's it for this one. I will catch you guys next time.